Welcome to Lamora's Cards, I'm Matthew, and this is another episode of Learn to Play, where I have experienced members of the community come on to teach you about one of their decks. If you enjoy this video, consider liking, commenting, subscribing, or supporting me on Patreon, like these amazing patrons did, so I can make more of these and make them better for you, as well as get access to perks like early videos and getting in games with me. With all that being said, let's pass it over to this episode's guest. Ah uh, yes, hello. I'm Sage, pronouns say them, and I'm a professional Magic the Gathering and D&D content creator. I have been playing Magic since 2014, and since then I've been playing EDH, picked up CEDH in about 2018, and yeah. I So Omnath Locus of Creation is a four color good stuff deck. It optimizes above all individual card quality in order to get the most potential out of our deck. The main winning strategy is to create infinite mana with Dockside and either Deadeye Navigator or Emiel the Blessed, and then use that to flicker Dryad Arbor three times in order to trigger Omnath three times. And then you reset Omnath by flickering Omnath and then doing that until your opponents are dead. One of the most important things when playing this deck is looking for opening hands that have a tutor, card draw, and ramp, which seems obvious, of course, in CDH, but especially because we're in a sans black pile, the tutors that we have access to are very limited, and what they're going to do is they're going to pull our creatures. Our creatures are our main vehicle, which lead us to our different lines that we can maneuver through while we're playing the deck. It has the creature-based Dockside Amiel combo, and it also has the Breach combo, and we can pivot between them based on the threats that we see on the board or what sort of stacks effects may affect us. This deck pressures wins as early as turn two, and the thing about this deck is that if you're not able to pull off that win attempt, you can try turn after turn after turn. The most important thing is to get Dockside onto the board and make sure it does not get exiled. If it goes to the graveyard, that's fine. That's no big deal. We can definitely work with that. But that is the card that this deck is built around. It is made to use and abuse Dockside Extortionist and is the main vehicle for a win condition. The second most important card is Spellseeker because it allows us to pivot between lines and also because we run ephemerate and final fortune that allows us to cheat out wins at unexpected points in the game and spellseeker also provides a lot of utility where if we are up against a stacks player we can get cyclonic rift which is going to be the main thing that's going to blow them out which is going to open up wins for us or we can get ella Domri's call we can get our final fortune we can get more interaction there are a lot of different ways that we can use that and especially when we can use our creatures that flicker other creatures we can open up a lot of utility with that, which is what makes the deck really fun, gives it a lot of nuance, and makes it incredibly resilient. The big reason to run Omnath over, for example, Thrasios in Bruce Tarl or Thrasios in Akiri is because what Omnath offers in the command zone is explosive mana advantage and is a combo piece in the command zone, which means that we have to tutor for less, which is very beneficial considering that we do not have access to black tutors, which can get us any card that we want. So having one of our combo pieces always accessible to us is very, very helpful and saves us a lot of steps in executing our combo. This deck can win as early as turn two, given the right hand, and it just pushes for wins every single turn after that. It is incredibly resilient, and it has a lot of staying power because this deck is optimized for individual card quality, so we get the most out of every card that we play. Typical turn one, we're looking to establish early mana or card advantage, so we're looking to throw down land mana crypt Rhystic Study, land Mystic Remora. If we're in a heavy blue pod, we're getting a carpet of flowers and a couple of mana dorks out very early is really helpful. We don't usually look to cast our commander until we're looking to win the game, but sometimes being able to put Omnath down early, getting that extra card, and then getting that mana advantage by playing and cracking a fetch land and getting access to five mana in a turn can lead to really explosive and really impactful turns that push our tempo so much faster than everyone else. We're looking to leverage the tempo game in order to push us a little bit faster than the faster decks who are playing rituals, we look to be able to match pace with those and to strategically deploy interaction to slow them down in order for us to take time to tutor for tutors before we can close the game in that optimal point where most people are tapped out or we've been able to sandbag one or two pieces of interaction in our hands in order to protect our wins. 
think the biggest misconception that people make for this deck is that it's a very mid-rangey deck and they seek to play it as a mid-range deck. They like to play it like there is a Thrasios in the command zone, but because we don't have that card advantage in the command zone, we have to actively look for it in our opening hands. That is one of the most important things. And so you need to play it almost like a storm deck. Proactive, it's looking to win quickly, it's looking to close it all in one turn. It's not going to grind out value very well, which I think is a common misconception, especially for these colors, especially given CDH decks that have been around in the past. What keeps me coming to this deck time after time and continuing to reiterate on it is that there is so much complexity with when you choose to deploy tutors, what you tutor for, and there is a very intricate timing to everything, which I think a lot of people find very daunting. But once you begin to master the tempo of CDH and you can be able to read the tempo of different decks and play into them or play against them, this deck opens up so many possibilities for really just nuanced gameplay that I think it's hard to find with other lists. And because we have the limitation of not having any black tutors, it really makes you think very creatively about what it is that you tutor for and at what time, most importantly. So mulliganing, I think, is one of the most important skills to learn in Magic and is one of the most difficult to learn because it requires a lot of reflection and hindsight. And for this deck in particular, because of our limitation on our colors that we have access to, most importantly, you want to have one creature tutor that tutors for a creature or tutors for an instant or sorcery, like Mystical Tutor in our opening hand, Spellseeker in our opening hand. Amazing. The next thing that we want to look for is two lands. Generally is good enough. A piece of fast mana like like a mana crypt or a chrome mox would do really well. We run a mix of mana dorks and mana rocks, so depending on what the pod composition looks like, you might want to look for more dorks or mana rocks, depending on who else you're playing with and turn order. And then looking for some piece of card advantage. So Sylvan Library, Mystic Remora, Ristic Study, something along those lines. Looking for one of those pieces and then a tutor is the most important. This deck mulligans very, very well, so you can easily go to four cards and feel very confident in winning the game. Going down to four or five cards is not a punishment when you consider the quality of cards that we're playing. Every card that we play impacts the board. It grows our hand, it gives us mana, and it is important to keep that in mind when playing. So if we're looking at this as an opening seven, we have basically one land because you want to hold up the Seiju for interaction generally. So it's generally considered interaction first. Absolutely, if you need it, land second. I mean, we could play the Seiju and play the bird. And then we have the mystical tutor that could go and get us our Neo form to sack the birds too to go get Dockside. But after that, we don't have another tutor, but we do have Ledger Shredder for some card draw, which is very interesting. This is a very tempting hand, but we don't have any counter spells. And then the final fortune is just a dead card for us. So I think looking at this, while it is pretty tempting, it's solid. If this were a six, I would keep it and bottom the final fortune. But since this is our opening seven, let's just look at another. All right, so we're looking at a six. This is tough though, because we don't have any red mana, but we can play the Hollowed Fountain and slam Esper Sentinel turn one. This deck does run 30 lands, which is a few more than your typical CD deck. Most are about 27 to 29 range. If that was the Volcanic Island, I would 100% keep this. I'm a risky player and a little bit greedy, so there's a part of me that's like, yeah, we'll definitely draw into a red source. It's fine. Bottom the Wheel of Fortune and just go. But this deck does mull well, so let's look at a five. We don't have any tutors. We have one piece of interaction that we're not going to have the colors for. Let's go to four. So we're at four, so I would keep this. I would keep Tropical Island, Swan Song, Noble Hierarch, and red elemental blast and I would just play this as a tempo hand I would look to slow down my opponents in the first couple of turns look for blow up by countering the heuristic study put them on the back foot by denying their card advantage and then just look to kind of chill <laughs> <laughs> Chill and draw some cards. If I know that there's a stacks player, like especially a creature based stacks player at the table, I would probably keep the Blasphemous Act, wait for them to drastically slow down the game, play out all their stacks creatures, sandbag that for a few turns, and then deploy that after we've had some time to be able to recoup our hands. It's not a great four, but it is what it is. 
One of the main pitfalls of the deck is that it folds to both Curse Totem and Null Rod effects because we rely on both activations of creatures and activating artifacts in order to execute our wins in both of our main lines in which we win because we have to activate either MEL or Jedi Navigator, so Curse Totem affects that, and then because we're generating infinite treasures by flickering Dockside, Stony Silence affects that. With our Underworld Breach lines, because we need to activate LED and recast that over and over again, Again, having a stony silence on board turns that off as well. This deck doesn't run any rituals, so we're wholly reliant on those two different avenues in order to win the game. So seeing those on the battlefield, they are must removes at all costs, otherwise you are out of the game. What it also struggles with is a rule of law. We can technically win under a rule of law, it just takes a lot of very fine finagling and being able to deploy things very slowly and make yourself seem not the threat, because with Deadeye or Emmy and Dockside and Omnath in play. We no longer have to cast any spells in order to win, but it's slowly getting those three onto the battlefield at the same time over the course of two to three turns is difficult and raises a lot of red flags. One of the big things that shuts us off is Yasharn because we can't sack our fetch lands, we can't sack treasures. That's a big note for us. So being able to deal with that is a must. There's a lot of interaction in this deck. Use it. Use it on things that affect you. Because the only thing that we pay life into is Sylvan Library, we don't have have to worry about being attacked. We generally have creatures, so we generally have blockers up for Timna, so we generally dissuade people from attacking us just by our board presence. And so that makes us actually pretty well positioned against Timna based decks or when there's an Adnod player in the pod. They tend to eat up a lot of the aggro and we get to just answer things casually and start to build up our value over time and plan for the time to win the game. I think with a four color pile where you don't have access to the best tutors in the format can be a little bit daunting, but it's okay. It plays a lot of great cards and it's a deck that you can definitely experiment with and it teaches you a lot about timing, about deploying interaction correctly, and it really, really re rewards resource management. So if you like managing how many cards you have, how much mana you have access to, how many treasures that you can generate off of a Dockside Extortion at any sort of time, if you love resource management, this deck rewards you in full for doing that very, very well. And the most difficult thing to do to master with this deck is tempo and and timing for deploying your wins. You just have to be persistent and a little bit brash, but you'll definitely get there. And the lines are very easy to grok. Knowing when to deploy them is the biggest learning obstacle for sure. But it's a deck that rewards experimenting and trying these things and looking for all the different utility or different uses out of each individual card. And so it definitely rewards creativity above all.